there. Have you ever had this experience? Oh, wow. G.W. <laughs> Johnson is on. It doesn't matter if it was out or not. So let's see. A.B.'s yelled out <laughs> twice, and he's hit two clean winners. Okay. Another out ball right. and another, another, point, yeah. another conversion. Just, just keep doing it. <laughs> and I don't mean playing a PPA final with Anna Bright, although that would be cool. I mean, you're having trouble letting out balls go even though your partner is telling you over and over, out, if this sounds familiar, you're not alone. Obviously, even the best of the best struggle with this. And it has nothing to do with poor judgment or lack of experience, especially not in JW's case. So in this video, I wanna talk about the brain processes involved in letting out balls go and why it's so much more difficult than we think it should be. And importantly, stick around until the end and I will share with you a couple of drills that you can do to help improve this skill. Let's get to it. The brain process that comes into play when we need to stop ourselves from hitting a ball is called response inhibition. It's our ability to interrupt an action or a movement once it's already started. And this is important in pickleball, of course, but in the real world, it can also be a matter of life or death because it's the same process that we call on when, for example, we start into an intersection and then realize that a car has run a red light and we need to stop abruptly. But when it comes to pickleball and we see a ball coming toward us, our brain is automatically preparing for a motor response. We're ready to intercept the ball with our paddle. This preparation begins even before we're consciously aware of it. There's research that goes back 40 years, all the way to 1985, that showed that neural activity associated with voluntary movement begins several hundred milliseconds before we have a conscious intention of even wanting to move. So during play, during pickleball, we're in a ready or a go state. But as soon as we recognize that a ball may be going out, our brains have to engage a second pathway, which is the stop process. In order to understand this, we need to head to the races. The horse race model was first proposed in 1984, and it suggests that the go and stop processes operate independently and race against each other. And this has been supported in functional MRI, showing that it's different pathways in the brain. The challenge with the stop process is that it takes time to implement, and it's competing against the go process that has already started. And so whichever process finishes first determines whether we will inhibit an action or go ahead and hit that out ball. The experimental design that has been used to test the horse race model is what's called the stop signal task. In these studies, a participant is given a go signal, like the flash of a green light, and then in about 25% of the trials after a variable delay, they'll get a stop signal, which may be a red light. The reason the stop signal occurs only about a fourth of the time is so that subjects don't anticipate the stop every single time. In these scenarios, completion of the go task is usually hitting a button. And the key measure from these experiments is the stop signal reaction time, which is the time it takes for the stop process to complete after the stop signal appears. In pickleball, when we see a ball coming toward us, the go process has already started. And when we see that it may be going out, that's when the stop process begins. And if the stop process is able to finish before the go process is completed, then we'll successfully inhibit that response. We'll have had a successful stop. If the go process finishes first, then we have a failed stop, or in other words, we will go ahead and hit that out ball. The stop signal reaction time in humans is typically about 200 to 250 milliseconds, and this can vary among individuals or be influenced by different factors. How does this translate to pickleball? In this video, and I'll put a link to it in the description below, I broke down the speed of the ball and the reaction time needed in an elite mixed doubles hand battle. Early in the exchange, Georgia had only about 280 milliseconds for the ball to travel from Ben's paddle to her paddle. But in the overall exchange of eight contacts, the average was about 380 milliseconds from paddle to paddle. So you can imagine if one of these balls is going out, that's a very small window of time for us to detect the stop signal and 
inhibit our response. This recognition time, or the time between the go response and the initiation of the stop stimulus, is called the stop signal delay. The longer the delay, the more likely we will fail at inhibiting our response. So in other words, the longer it takes us to realize the ball is going out, the less likely we are to be able to stop ourselves from hitting it. Conversely, the earlier we detect that, the better chance we may have of stopping ourselves from hitting the out ball. As an individual, our primary cue that a ball is going out, our stop signal, is usually picked up visually. Our visual system not only sees where the ball is now, but based on its trajectory, its speed, its spin, it also makes a prediction about where the ball will be in the immediate future and whether it may be going out. But if we detect that a ball is going out and our partner is about ready to hit it, we can help because inhibitory responses are actually faster with an auditory stop stimulus compared to visual stop stimuli. I mentioned that the stop signal reaction time is around 200 to 250 milliseconds, but that's from visual stop signals. Auditory stop signals are processed through a more direct pathway to the motor inhibition centers in our brains, and these can occur as quickly as 150 to 180 milliseconds. So we should definitely speak up to help our partners let out balls go. And not only do we need to give them that signal early, again, the earlier we can get the stop signal stimulus or the shorter the stop signal delay, the better our chance of inhibiting our response. But also, this study showed that the louder the volume or higher decibel auditory stop signals had a quicker inhibitory response. Even more, in this badminton study, having multi-sensory processing, so combining both visual and auditory stop signals was faster than either auditory or visual alone. Again, the combination of us being able to see that a ball is going out and then also hear as early and as quickly as we can from our partner that it's going out, the better chance we have of being able to let those balls go. As a complete aside, tactile responses have been shown to be even quicker than visual or auditory stop stimuli. So if you have a newer car that has self-driving or driver assistance features, you may have noticed that if you start to move out of your lane or if you change lanes without signaling that your steering wheel will vibrate. And the reason for this is that tactile feedback will help us most quickly respond and correct our course. There are several factors that can affect our stop signal reaction time, like being under pressure. So you may find that in a competitive environment or in a tournament that you are hitting more out balls than maybe you normally do in rec play. Fatigue can also significantly impact our reaction time. There's a study from 2014 that showed that both mental and physical fatigue slowed down response inhibition. So as a match progresses or as you get deeper into the tournament, again, don't be surprised if you're having a little bit more trouble letting those out balls go. There's even another layer for why our inhibitory response can be difficult that goes beyond brain pathways and delves into evolutionary psychology. Our brains have evolved to favor action over inaction, particularly in a threatening situation. It's what psychologists call action bias. So in a sports context like pickleball, we have an inherent drive to hit the ball rather than let it go. And this is reinforced by the sensory feedback of contacting the ball, hearing the sound, seeing the result, as opposed to letting the ball go, which doesn't really give us any feedback other than the delayed satisfaction potentially of winning the point. And this action bias is particularly strong in fast paced situations like hand battles, where we have a limited time to decide and we're more likely to want to take action. The good news is that more experienced pickleball players do have better inhibitory control. And it's not just because they may have faster stop signal reaction times, but it's because they've been able to train their brains and their bodies to recognize the situations where a ball may be going out. Practicing inhibitory control can improve our capacity. So here they are. Drill number one, have a partner feed balls to you while randomly calling stop for some of the shots. This is basically the stop signal task experiment applied in a pickleball context. When you hear stop, you have to inhibit your swing completely, regardless of where you are in it and if you think the ball's going in or out. Have your practice partner start with the verbal signal coming early, then gradually make it later and more challenging. Again, if we think about the horse race model, the stop signal delay, so that time between the go and the stop signal is a critical factor 
in whether or not we can inhibit our responses. So the longer the delay, the harder it will be for us to inhibit our response or to not hit the out ball. Drill number two is what I call the no-go test. Same situation where you're standing at the kitchen line and you have a practice partner hitting a mix of balls at you, you're gonna let all of them go, whether you think they're in or out. But before they pass you by, you're gonna audibly say in or out. You're learning to detect which balls, where they are relative to your height, your shoulders, the angles that they're coming, the trajectory, the spin, the, the depth, everything. You're learning a physical feel for what balls are in or out. So gradually start head to head and then have your practice partner go at more of an angle such that you're cross court from each side. And again, you're getting a physical sense of the trajectories that are more likely to be in or be out. The third drill is a go, no go. So it's the exact same drill, but now you're gonna hit the balls that you think are in and let the out balls go that you think are out. Like the challenge progression that we talked about earlier, you want your practice partner to do slower feeds at first, have them be more obviously out versus the in, and then have it be faster and faster and more subtle and subtle closer to the lines. This progressive approach helps your brain adapt to making the inhibitory responses under increasing time pressure. So it's similar then to what you might face in actual games. The next phase of this drill is to add a pressure component. So maybe add scoring into the scenario where you get one point for letting an out ball go, your practice partner gets one point if you let the ball go but it turns out to be in, and maybe you subtract one point if you hit an out ball. Granted, this means that you have to trust your practice partner if she says the ball was headed out and you hit it, but their job is really to try to tempt you and lure you into hitting out balls. The next layer of difficulty is to add distraction, since distraction and fatigue can affect our inhibitory control. And the way to do this is to have your practice partner continue to feed balls, but call out a number that you have to repeat as you're hitting the ball or as you're letting the ball go or they can make it even more challenging by having you add or subtract numbers as you're getting ready to hit the ball. Because, yeah, we all know math is hard. Being able to add that cognitive load of doing math is an added source of fatigue or distraction. And if you can still dial in your inhibitory control in practice, that's gonna benefit you in a competitive environment. Of course, you don't need to do these drills every day, but. I bet if you do 10 minutes of one or two of these each time you practice, that you'll start to see and hear a difference in your ability to let those out balls go. Another option off the court is to do visualization practice. I plan to do a dedicated video on visualization at some point, but the key is that mental repetition activates many of the same neural pathways as physical practice. You wanna make these visualizations as vivid as possible. Imagine the sound of the ball, see its trajectory and where on your body it's approaching you. You'll have honed your sensitivity to this after you've done the drilling sessions in real life. And as you're letting the ball go in your visualization, feel the restraint in your muscles as you inhibit movement. And then importantly, allow yourself to see the ball going out and celebrate the satisfaction of having let it go. Again, you don't need to do too much of this for it to be effective, just a couple of minutes. Imagine doing maybe 20 balls to each shoulder and maybe 10 balls when you're in the transition zone. Three to five minutes, a couple times a week, will also help augment the work that you're doing on the court. The last thing that you can do to improve this skill is to record your matches or your practice sessions. And look at the instances where you're successful letting out balls go or where you may be hitting them and start to look for patterns. Are you more likely to hit them on your backhand or your forehand, coming cross court, straight ahead, mid court, if you can identify a couple areas where you're struggling, you can take that awareness back out onto the court when you drill or when you do the visualizations. Here's a summary from what we've covered. Number one, letting out balls go is a competitive race between go and stop processes in our brains. Number two, auditory stop signals are faster than visual signals to inhibit a response. So help your partner by calling the ball out early and loudly. Number three, we can improve our inhibitory control with physical practice, mental strategies, and video review. Start simply and then increase the challenge by manipulating factors like timing, court position, pressure, and cognitive load. Doing math. Right now, drop me a comment and let me know what drill you're gonna try first. And while you're there, 
Let me know if there are any other ideas for content that you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.